Welcome to Friday's Timescast. Today, we take a hard look at the TARP bailout and its effect on midterm elections. Don't expect to see a lot of gloating either by the administration or by congressional candidates. As the program comes to an end, we look at how it fared. And it's going to take maybe two or three years to unwind all of these programs. And we visit a busy New York emergency room. Pulse or no pulse? Start a CPR, please. Graphics editor Amy Shanefeld and editor David Gillen make sense of the TARP money. Amy, when Washington began bailing out the banks and then the car companies, nobody really seemed to be quite sure how much this was going to cost taxpayers. But here we are, two years later, still really big numbers. But the thinking is that maybe it's not going to cost us quite as much as we thought. Now, you've been putting together some, some numbers, crunching them. And what have you found? Well, we wanted to take the expiration date of TARP on Sunday as sort of a moment to take a good look at, at all the programs in the accounting. First, the majority of the programs are actually still active, and there's a fair amount of uh, money that's still outstanding, about $200 billion. Which means the bailouts aren't really over They're yet. not really okay. over. There's about $200 billion in the hands of AIG, 600 banks, Chrysler, GM, and GMAC. And the other thing we wanted to point out with the chart was that some of the programs are expected to lose money in the end and some are expected to gain money. Well, let's start with the banks. They got the biggest share of the TARP pie. Yes, they did about $250 billion. Um, and across the board, cost estimates put it as a money-making program, you know, maybe upwards of $20 billion. AIG, on the other hand, is very much in flux. The Treasury recently revealed it could make money in the end. Right. Now, they've just announced plans that they're going to try to extricate themselves sure. from AIG. But again, that's really it's up unclear. Year. And there were estimates earlier in the year that it could cost upwards of $50 billion. Automakers and uh, housing programs, those are also, you know, expected to be money losers. I mean, and, you know, the final accounting of all this could be years. Could be a couple of years. It may take a while to unwind all of these programs. The TARP has proved to be a real success story, both for President Obama and for Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner. But don't expect to see a lot of gloating either by the administration or by congressional candidates for office. We're only four weeks out from the midterm elections. Already, several candidates have lost their renomination races or nomination races for higher office because of the stigma of their vote for TARP in October of 2008. Voters are not going to be convinced if they already think it's a bad thing. In four weeks, you cannot convince them that it wasn't. Certainly now, candidates have a positive response to make. But I don't see anyone taking the initiative to say, hey, I voted for TARP in October 2008, and you may actually make some money on this. It's just become more than a vote. It's about big government, big government getting involved in the economy. And even if it was necessary, as most analysts would tell you it was at the time, it's still never going to be a popular vote. Today, emergency rooms are busier than ever, despite predictions that managed care would thin the crowds. A look at a coming story from one of the country's busiest hospitals, Maimonides in Brooklyn. So we can't locate family for him? Dr. Hillary Cohen is nearing the end of a hectic 12-hour shift at the emergency room at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. These days, emergency rooms across the country are busier than ever, and Maimonides is one of the busiest. I'm going to be there in a minute. It is not a designated trauma hospital, but it receives plenty of critically ill patients. So we're doing a whole bunch of stuff to you now. We just want to repeat the EKG, see what that looks like, and then we'll go from there. A 40-year-old man arrives at the hospital after fainting at the gym. I was running in the gym, took a shower, and then I started feeling dizzy and a lot of aches on my shoulder. And then went to the locker room and started feeling more dizzy again. I put my head down, and before you know it, I was out. This could be a lot of different things. Common things being common, it's probably going to turn out that you were at the gym and you hadn't been there for a month or so, and you, if I ran 55 minutes on a treadmill, I'm sure I would go flat down, probably after about 30 minutes. Dr. Cohen has worked in emergency medicine for a decade and believes that health care in the United States is in crisis. People feel that, okay, I can, you know, I can smoke and I can, you know, I can eat too much and I can not exercise, but it's okay because I'm going to go to my doctor and he's going to be able to give me a pill for my diabetes and, you know, a pill for my hypertension and a pill for my high cholesterol, and I'm not going to actually have those diseases, which is wrong. We can patch you up and we can put you back together, but we're not going to be able to make you healthy. The rest of Dr. Cohen's story and a deeper look at Maimonides will be available later today on nytimes.com. Please join us next week for another edition of Timescast.